Greetings. I hope and trust I find you well and welcome to the Solus University Support School class. I know some of you may be getting ready to go out for your camping experience, especially in Zimbabwe, where we'll be having our camping meetings as from tomorrow morning and starting tomorrow evening in particular. May the good Lord go with you, my dear friends. Before we go into this study, why don't we pause for a moment and call upon the name of the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we are about to go into the study of your word. How we pray, dear Lord, that you may speak to us, especially on the issues that relate to systems and national state of affairs. And dear Lord, may you visit us and even touch both our hearts and our minds. I pray for those who will be watching this lesson from whatever they may be. Visit them, O Lord, and minister unto their needs and desires according to your riches in glory. This is our fervent prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are on Lesson 7 and we're looking at the indestructible hope. And this indestructible hope, it comes about when there is a lot that would sap one's hope that will take away from our energy. We begin in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk writes in chapter 1, and I wish to read this passage in your hearing. you find this very interesting. Let's begin at verse 2 in the NIV. How long must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Verse 4 is the one that I'm particularly interested in. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous and saw that justice is perverted. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. As the man of God pans this passage, I sense his frustration. Frustration at injustice that is happening at a national level. We have the righteous being the ones who are victims and those who are unrighteous being the ones who benefit from the systems. Now, Habakkuk cries unto the Lord. I want us to take note of this. As Habakkuk cries unto the Lord, he is making a statement on legal matters. He is making a statement on jurisprudence that existed at that time. What was the jurisprudence of the day, one may inquire. This was a period when God set up the judiciary, when God set up the monarchy. These were appointed by God and God had set up these systems. And therefore he cries unto the Lord to say, I am afflicted. There is a lot of uh, injustice that is driving. Dear Lord, how long will I pray and you will not hear me? As he is praying, his prayer is for a redress and he appeals to God. And later on, we want to look at how do we deal with injustice in the land? How do we address these issues? Now, as he cries unto the Lord, he also makes this revelation. God, you're not answering my prayers. It is very painful to have a scenario where you are suffering an injustice. You are praying to the Lord and he is silent. Your hope will be destroyed. Let us move on to the next session. God now then says, you are a sovereign nation, Israel, but I'm going to carry you out into captivity. The Chaldeans who are going to come. These are the Babylonians. When these Babylonians have come, this is what is going to happen. They're going to carry you out into captivity and you're going to go into exile. When Israel goes into exile, they are no more a sovereign state. They are no more a monarchy, but they lose all these. And this means they have been downgraded. Go to the book of Psalm 137. What does the Psalter provide for? This particular chapter speaks to a particular uh, epoch in the history of Israel. It has even been converted into songs. We know this song. By the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and there we wept as we remembered Zion. Here's a second issue that would destroy the hope of many. Number two, where you are by the rivers of Babylon and you remember Zion. What is happening here is Israel is suffering from what we would call nostalgia. The bygones are way better than where we are today. 
So they look back and they say, we have done better than where we are before. This can be another reason for your hope to be destroyed. Now, as they are seated by the rivers of Zion, what is happening? They are tormentors. They are tormentors. Call upon them to sing the songs of Zion. Now, when you now have a tormentor, this is where someone makes it their business to inflict pain and suffering upon you. The children of Israel are now being tormented in foreign land. As they are tormented, it is a reason for hope to be destroyed. And they are seated there. These are political figures. These are not only political figures, but they are their masters. They are demanding songs of praise. These songs of praise are being demanded by politicians. When politics is no longer ashamed to step into the territory of faith, this is a violation of a religious right. Now the politicians are now telling them, sing songs of Zion. Now they are asking this question within themselves. It is a dilemma. How can we sing King Arthur's song in a strange land? When you begin to sing the songs of Zion in strange places, it gives you a dilemma and a mix-up in your mind. This is the other cause for hope to be destroyed. Failure to reconcile things that are out of order. And lastly, being in a strange land, being in a foreign land. I know I'm talking to some people who may be uh, migrants. They may be political asylum seekers. You may be economic refugees. You are in a strange land. And you're asking yourself, Lord, I am so far from home. And your hope is bound to be destroyed. So Israel goes through this particular phase as a second phase. And thirdly, Israel now returns from Babylon. This is Judah, by the way. They're going back no longer as nationals, no longer as natives, but they're going back as a vassal state. Thereafter, the nation of Judah became uh, a province of the Roman Empire up to the time that Jesus was born. So they did not really, they did not really go back to their sovereignty that they enjoyed at an earlier point. So this phase that we're going through, these destroyers of hope, injustice in a sovereign land. Number two, violation of rights in exile. Violation of rights as a migrant. And even when you come back home where you have lost everything that you ever had, and you remember even when the temple was now being uh, set up, they even moaned and said, Ichabod, the glory of the Lord has departed. That is nostalgia. As we look back to the days of plenty and the days of more. What are the applications that we can look at? As we look at number one, injustice. Injustice. As you go to, to law school, you're going to be given this appreciation. The laws are set up for three basic reasons. Number one, to foster peace, order, and good governance. So a case of injustice arises where there is disorder, where there is no peace, and where there is no good governance. So as Habakkuk now writes, I, I want us to look at our period, the epochs within which we live. When you talk about the law, the law then, you, you may have had the law as given by God. Now the law is made by parliaments when they sit. They enact the law. So in the study of law, there is, in the jurisprudence of law, they are what are known as positivists. The post positivists, they actually say the law is that which is made by parliament, that which is made by the legislature. Now there is the other school of thought in jurisprudence, the school of the naturalists. The naturalists advance that even though the law is made by the legislature. It must have the DNA, which is morality. So when the law is immoral, it does not qualify as a legal norm. So when Habakkuk is now crying against injustice, he is actually saying, let the law be upheld. Let the law apply consistently across the board. There is this Latin term that you're going to find in law school. It says, lex in justa, non est lex. What it simply means is that an unjust law is no law at all. So this unjust law, how is it dealt with? It must not be complied with. It must not be regarded as a legal law. So Habakkuk goes to God and he says, God, 
the law is no longer being applied. I don't know where you're watching this from. Is this true of the place where you're here from? Is the law not being applied? There are some who are an exception. They are above the law. So Habakkuk appeals to God. What should the modern Christian do? We have the same opportunity to appeal to God. But we can also deal with these crucibles by way of constitutional redress. There are three basic uh, propositions I'm going to give to you. Number one, you can petition the legal bodies. Number two, you can take up decisions that have been made by these legal bodies on judicial review. That is applied to the courts so the laws can be applied consistently. And number three, where those who are in authority do not exercise their oath of office consistently at the next plebiscite. That is five years we get to vote for parliamentary and presidential elections. That is where you exercise your displeasure. As you pray for these issues as crucibles that you're going through, there are some crucibles where you have the power in your hand to take them away. Do pray, but also take action. You also want to look at the scenario where you have been taken out into exile. You are in a situation where you can do virtually nothing about your condition. As an emigrant, as an asylum seeker, as someone who has run away from a war-torn area, you find yourself victimized in those places where you cannot exercise a right to vote. What do you do? You pray unto the Lord. And the Lord does bring his children through. There are, of course, biblical imperatives. When we have prayed, the lessons that we get from here, go to Isaiah 41 from verse 8 to verse 14. What you're going to realize there is that God actually speaks to the children of Israel and he says, I will hold you by my right hand. God also speaks through the same Isaiah and he says, I'm going to raise up Cyrus, my servant, who is going to take you out of bondage. This is the assurance that we have. And this particular assurance helps us to appreciate that when we go through crucibles that we cannot change, God holds us by his right hand. He carries us through. And he has plans for a Cyrus who is yet to be born to lead us out of bondage. God does not end there. Go to the book of Jeremiah, at chapter 29, verses 1 up to 10. He actually declares, I have carried you into captivity. Wherever we find ourselves, God has carried us there. Not only has he carried us there, he actually turns to the children of Israel secondly and he says, now that you are here, look for land, marry, build, settle down. God gives us residence in those moments of pain and injustice. And he says, I want to build you where you are at. When you are done with that, number three, Pray for the peace and prosperity of the land where I have carried you. Take time to pray for nations where you are being evicted and you are a persona non grata. No one wants you there. Pray for the peace and prosperity of those places. That's what God says. And then he turns to them particularly and he says, I know the plans that I have for you. What are these plans? Number one, not to harm you. What are these plans? To prosper you. What are these plans? To give you an expected end. God speaks into the near future and he says, even when you have gone through these crucibles, I need you to know you have a reason to find hope. You have a reason to find hope. God actually, if you're going to check, there are many other persons that come during this period and they contribute towards the growth of the nation of Israel while they are in bondage. We've already looked at Isaiah. There is Jeremiah. There is Ezekiel. There is Daniel. There is Nehemiah. There is Zerubbabel, there is Ezra. All in all, there are seven of them and they come together and minister unto the growth and revival of the hope of Israel. When we are in those tough times, what do we learn? God brings people into our company who will ensure that our hope is not destroyed. Let us consider a hymn that you know so well. And I'm sure you have sung this hymn. As a takeaway, do sing it along wherever you may be. You know, this song was written by Edward Moat. It says, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest girl, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. 
On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know, Edward Mote was not a minister of the gospel or anyone of renown. By the time he penned this particular song, he was but a cabinet maker on attachment, an intern. And his master decides to bring him along into a church, whereat he heard the music, the melody that was coming through as the brethren sang their hearts out. He was impressed to pen a poem, and this was the poem that he penned. A couple of weeks down the line, a friend had a wife who was on a deathbed. He was invited to give words of comfort. While they, he went into this poem, and he read the verses and repeated it four times, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Should you be disappointed by the legal system in your nation, on Christ the solid rock do stand, for all other ground is sinking sand. Your hope will not be destroyed thereafter. Should you be looking at the bygones and saying, I wish things were like what they used to be before. In the case of nostalgia, all other ground is sinking sand, but Christ should be your solid rock. And thirdly, Notice this, the children of Israel have been carried away into captivity by Babylon. But they arose when Cyrus set them free, and they returned to Judea, even though it was a province now. Having returned to Judea, you may be in your phase of Babylon. The book of Revelation makes it clear, Babylon shall arise, and Babylon, Babylon is fallen. It shall fall, and before long, we shall have the fulfillment of Revelation 21. That I beheld... And the former earth and the former heavens were passed away. And there stood in their places a new earth and a new heaven. Jesus is saying unto you this morning, Behold, I make all things new. Let these be a reason for your hope not to be destroyed. Look upon Jesus and see the bigger issues of life. Until we meet again, may God bless you and prosper you. Amen and amen.